That leads me to the text I want to talk about today. We all know that Jesus, after he was baptized, the first thing that happened to him was he was led up onto the mount, we call it the Mount of Temptation. You see, after every blessing, there comes a test. Whenever we are blessed, the humans know that somewhere down the line, pretty soon after, it's going to come a test. And so after the beauty of the blessing of his baptism, it says immediately Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit to a mountain to be tested of Satan for 40 days. And it's in this context that I want to speak this word today. Because if you read the passage in Matthew 4 of the Gospels, you read how Jesus came up the mountain, was tempted, the same temptations we are, it's lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life, it was all the same. And he had victory over those things because he knew what was written. Now you say, he, surely he knew it. Of course he knew it. He wrote it. But the fact was that he used it is written as a powerful tool, as the only tool to overwhelm the subtlety of Satan, who is our enemy. So let's learn from the boss today about how to handle trials, temptations, and testing by using that which is written. It was Charles Spurgeon who said this. He said, the clearest and most important explanation or exposition of the revelation of God and what is on his mind is in this inspired book. That's all you need. I know there's some great literature out there, but there is nothing like this book to teach you what is on God's mind, to teach you what God finds to be valuable, to teach you what you should be living like, to establish for you your moral compass, to establish for you a way of life that would be meaningful, not just for you, but a benefit to the people around you and to the kingdom of God. It's all people in this book. And we want to look at this book to see what is it that is written that is so powerful that can help me in the context of trials and testings and tribulation. Well, I, I want to start by, by maybe saying this. You know, very often it's the setting of something that creates its beauty even more. Have a look at, if you go down to Haskins Jewelers, they're great jewelers, and they design rings. And you have a look at the rings, and I'm not an expert on rings by any manner or means, but I notice a pattern there. They'll take that which is the most beautiful, and they place it in amongst those things that may be not quite as beautiful, maybe pretty ordinary. But the setting of that main stone is emphasized by the environment or the setting of the stones around it. All the purpose of those stones around it is to make the other stone look better. And so when they do these things, it's very beautiful, but your eye is attracted to the stone in the middle where the all others are making it look even better. If you have a look at nature, have a look at a, a rose. It shows the same principle. A rose is the most beautiful of flowers, this most magnificent flower. You know what you've got to get through to get to the rose? You've got to get through the, the thorns. You know, nobody wants to cut roses because they know they're going to have to get through the thorns before they can get to the bloom. The beauty of the bloom is accentuated and affirmed and strengthened by the context of the thorns that it grows up in. It makes the beauty of the rose even more beautiful. Now, that's what the Word of God is. It is written in the Word of God, is the most powerful, beautiful aspect of what God has given to us, and the setting of tests and trials and tribulations makes it even better. It's a great setting for that which is just so awesome as we find it in this book. Now, Jesus' life was full of temptations and tests. We all know that. His life and his ministry began at the point that I'm about to read to you, Matthew chapter 4, at the point of the test that took place on the Mount, uh, Mount of Temptation. It began there, and it ended with the test of the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was tested by Satan and sweat of blood, and Jesus was saying, Father, is there not another way through this thing? Is there not another plan? And Jesus passed both tests, otherwise he would not be here today. Now, in the context of Jesus' testing, Jesus holds high the Word of God. Martin Luther, he said this. He said, the three best tools to build a good Christian life are these three things. The first one is prayer. Yeah, we get that. The second one is the, the, uh, the sort of contemplation upon the Word of God. And then the third one, he says, is temptation. Because temptation gets you to prove 
the aspects of the Word of God in prayer that makes it legitimate and makes it powerful. And so these three things are the three things that make for better Christian living and a greater Christian experience. You say, is testing part of that? Apparently it is, because it's in testing that we find the beauty and the strength of the Word of God. It's in testing that we find that God is who He says He is. It all comes at the point of testing. Now, in our early morning devotional series that we're doing right now, you can find it, I think, on the YouTube um, or other, other means. Uh, we're dealing with this, so I would encourage you to go back to this, the beginning of this last week. We talk about passing the test, what it means to pass the tests of life. And we're doing a journey through the book of Genesis, looking at all the characters and the heroes of Genesis to have a look at the different tests that they went through. Some passed and some failed. But into this context of test and trial and tribulation, I would recommend that maybe even just for this phase that you watch those things every morning. Now, Luther was right. Temptation is part of the Christian experience. If it was part of Jesus's, it will have to be part of ours. Let me read to you. Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Then Jesus was, this was after his baptism. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter, that is Satan, came to him and said, if, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's temptation one. When the devil took, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. That's a high place, and it's a holy place. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the foolish test. Now, we'll deal with the other one next week. But do not put your Lord your God to the foolish test. Now, the temptation of Jesus, the location of this, the setting of this is intriguing. Satan took him to the highest place he could find, which was on the top of the temple, so it was high. But the temple was also a holy place. In the Jewish tradition and the Jewish religion, the temple was the holy place, the, the dwelling place in those days of God. And so there's got to be some significance to him taking Jesus to the place that is high, but the place that is holy at the same time. The temple was high and it was a holy place. Now, I'm going to tell you, in a high place, it's hard to stand. Because generally, it's very narrow, and you just look over the edge and think, whew, you know, one step this way and I'm down. One step this way, and I'm also down. It's a vulnerable place. It's a place that is extremely, extremely difficult to stand because it's high. And the second reason that it's high is because of this thing, I think they call it vertigo, where you stand on the top of the high place and you look down and you have this strange feeling that you want to throw yourself off. Have you ever felt that? It's the craziest thing. I remember going to the Empire State Building with Gary Brackley once. We're standing on the top of this, this thing, and they've got barriers all the way around their fences to stop people following the natural inclination to throw themselves down and also to help not the guys who want to commit suicide from doing that. But there's something within us that draws us to destruction. There's something in there. But the first aspect of standing on a high place is the issue of balance, of balance. You're on a high place. Let me tell you how you balance walking on the high place is you emphasize the holy place. You see, where Jesus was put was high, but it was also holy. I see a lot of people who want to walk on the high place. Do you not see that? And yet they fall down in their Christian experience because they haven't elevated the holy with it. There's a balance that takes place in our Christian experience between the high place and the holy place. Balance is vital. Now, some people want to walk the high road, but they don't want to take holiness with them. And we, as people in the church, we watch the news, we, we hear what's going on out there. In the modern day, there are so many examples of people who have been high in this, the church and in the realm of the spiritual, that people are looking up to them because they're so high. But the problem is they were high, but they were not holy, and it was only a matter of time before it caught up on them and they fell. 
Now, I don't want to sit in judgment of them because any one of us could actually be in that particular place. But here's the warning that we have. If you want to walk on the high place, you better take holiness with you. If you want to walk and be high in the realm of the spiritual life, you better take holy with you because there is a balance that exists between the two of these two things. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, a great story. It's of a king. He was a young man, came to be the king. His name was Uzziah. He was a great king. He did really good things. He got the nation on track. He didn't worship idols. He did a, a really good thing. And as a king, he was walking high, man. As a, he was elevated, he was high. People respected him. The nation loved him. And he was walking really, really high. But unfortunately, he left holiness behind. And he, one day he went into the temple and he saw the priest there. And he said to the priest, hey, today I will offer incense to God. And the priest said, we don't think that's a good idea at all. And they said, well, he said, why not? They said, because it is written that that's the job of the priest. You cannot be, a, even if you're the king and you're on the highest of places, the priest has to offer the incense to God. He says, don't you know how high I am? Don't you know I am the king? And then I have had God's blessing. Look at the nation. Everything is really fantastic right now. Surely, surely, surely that God will accept me to offer the incense to him. And the priest said, we don't think that's a good idea. In fact, we think that idea is horrible, but the king took it. And Uzziah said, get out of my way. And he took the incense, and he walked into the place where only the priest should have gone. And when he walked out, he was covered with leprosy. He lived in isolation for the rest of his life. People, you don't want to mess with the holy. If you want to walk high in your Christian experience, which I hope you all do, you want to take on more, more adventure. You want to take, have more influence. And that's a good thing. You better bring holiness with you. It's such a good thing for people to have ambition in the church. It's not wrong to say, I want to have more influence. I, would, I really want to be a leader in the church. I'd love to run a cell group. I'd love to be a kids' church teacher. I'd love to be in a worship team. I'd love, to, I'd love to preach. I'd love to be an elder or a deacon or something. And that's a great ambition. In fact, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, it's encouraged. It says this, He who desires to be an overseer. That means somebody who wants to be a deacon or somebody who takes on more, more responsibility in the church desires a noble thing. That's a good thing. There are people who want to say, I want to have more it's, it Paul says it's a noble thing, but it's a scary thing because people who want to elevate the height have to take the holy with them. If you have the height and not the holiness, it's only a matter of time, and the demise will happen. The second reason I mentioned is this natural inclination within us towards self-destruction. Do you know you're born with that nature? Within us is this, this strange bias towards self-destruction as seen by standing on the top of a high thing, and there's this little thing to say, yo, man, I just feel like a, whew, yo, man, I need to get out of here before I jump over the wall, you know? This natural inclination towards self-destruction. Satan loves that. And Satan is behind you saying, why don't you just do like I told Jesus, throw yourself down. It's a natural inclination to throw yourself down. Just throw yourself down. And the Bible says it is written that the angels will come and they will scoop you up so you don't dash your foot against the stone. It's a natural inclination. And Satan will build upon that to tell you to do, follow your natural inclination toward self-destruction. Some do it. Some people do. Natural inclination. They don't need encouragement to jump, and destruction is in the path. We do this to ourselves. You know that story Jesus told of the prodigal son? It epitomizes this so beautifully. The, 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 the prodigal son fell for the three big things. He felt, felt for the need for power, for, for, for popularity, and for passion. Those are the three things that will pause you to go over the edge. He wanted the power, and money is power. He says, Dad, give me my money, because when you give me my inheritance, I will have power, because he who has the gold makes the rules, and I will have power. And he thought that if he could have that. Then he wanted popularity. He spelt it on his money on all the wrong people. Then he had passion. He did all sorts of illicit things, that, and he ended up in the, in the dregs. And, and then he wondered why God didn't bless him. But I don't think he did. Because it says he came to his right mind, and his right mind said to him, you know, I don't want to, I cannot live 
the way I want to live and walk the high road. I have to say, if I want to be high, I have to take holiness with me. And I have left holiness back at my father's house. And he had to learn the lesson of repentance and restoration with God. You say, well, what hope is there for those who are on the high place? If we want to, if we want to serve God to a greater degree, if we want to have more influence for the kingdom, what is it that's going to keep me on track in the high place? Let me tell you, it's the same thing that got you out of the dregs of the sinful place. It's called grace. You know, the wonder of grace is that grace gets me out of the mess of sin. Amazing grace gets me out of the sin of a wretch like me. That was who I was. And amazing grace elevates me out of the muck and the mire of a sinful life. And he would say, well, what's going to keep you from falling off the top? The same thing. Grace will do the same job for you. You see, for us who, who desire to walk with God at a higher level, God's grace is seen in various ways. But one of the greatest ways that God's grace is seen is seen through the gift to us of this amazing book. This is God's grace to you to help you to walk and to keep stable on the high place. That's why Jesus used it. It is written. What is written in this book will keep you at the high place if you do it, if you do it. So God has given us this most beautiful book. It's a tool that God has given us to keep us in a high place. It's a picture of grace. But as much as this is a tool of God to help us stand on the high place, Satan too is a tool. You know what his tool is? It's doubt. He's always used doubt. Satan will never come to you and say, oh, that's not true. That's not true. He will say, are you sure that's true? Are you, have you thought this thing through? And when you read the Word of God, the beautiful grace is seen in the Word of God, Satan will come with a counter, a counter proposal to you to say, mm, I doubt that. You know, I, I doubt that, you know, that the Bible is, is true in all, in all points. I doubt that you can really trust the Bible in every aspect of life. I doubt very much that the Bible is going to get you through grief and hardship and pain. I doubt that very much. And Satan, all he will do is tell you and throw these seeds of doubt at you that this book and that God is not enough. I've got to tell you people, God and this book are all that you need to walk the high road. God's grace is enough. But here's Satan. Satan comes and he twists it. And he comes with that, that verse. And it comes out of Psalm 91, the one about, about that, throw yourself down, because the, the, it is written that the angels will come and protect you from bashing your foot against a stone. That is written. But the if is an intriguing if. If you read the if in the Psalm 91, it says, if you make the most high your dwelling place, and then in all your ways acknowledge him, and then you, then you fall and you trip it, then your angels, God's angels will protect you. But if the if is the if that Satan gave to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, you know, if you, are, then if you throw yourself down, is a deliberate act against the will of God, then he, he says, but God will do that. I'm going to tell you people, that's Satan's perfect tool. He's always done it. In the Garden of Eden, did God really say you couldn't eat of that tree? God's holding back from you. You, you, did God really say that? I'm sure, he, I'm sure he did, if he did say that, he didn't really mean that. He said you can have every tree. And it's the doubts that Satan throws into our minds that can lead us to the demise. If you throw yourself down, that's not what it says in Psalm 91. Satan is twisting the most beautiful truth of God. Now, it is written, can get you and keep you out of a lot of trouble. Jesus, it says, Spurgeon says this of Jesus. He says, Jesus met a promise misused with a precept properly applied. Think about that. That's a cool saying. That Jesus met a promise misused, is what Satan threw at him on the mountain, and with a precept or a principle properly applied. You see, therein lies the thing. The precept Make sure that the promise is fulfilled. You say, how, I, how, how much should I love the precepts? Well, I would suggest you love them a lot. Let me read to you about how much you should love the precepts of God. We want the promise of God, don't we? We all, we all want God to fulfill His promise to us. But the promise is dependent upon us fulfilling the precept. 
How many times have I had people come to me and say, hey, Chuck, can you pray for God's blessing upon me? I said, well, tell me about your life. And I find out that this oak is living a stinking life. I find out that there's no honoring of God and the precepts and the laws of God. And he wants God's blessing. I don't know how many times I made myself rather unpopular by saying, actually, I don't think it would be wise for me to pray for you. Get your act together. Follow the law of God. Follow the precepts of God. And then I'd be happy to pray for God's blessing and the fulfillment of his promise for your life. But until you get your act together and understand the power of holy living, this is how much. In Psalm 119, it's beautiful. This is written as, a, as an honoring, not of the promise, but an honoring of the precept. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. He's not talking about promises. He's talking about his love for the precepts of God. This is what he says. Verse 161. Rulers persecute me without cause, but my heart trembles at your word. I rejoice in your promise like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day, I praise you for your righteous laws. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. I wait for your salvation, O Lord, and I follow your commands. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. I obey your precepts and your statutes, for all my ways are known to you. Man, this guy really loves the precepts of God. No wonder God gives him the promise. No wonder God fulfills the promises because he loves the precepts. You can love the promises and not do the precepts, and the promises become null and void. I sometimes think promises are like sweets. Too many without care, and you can end with truth decay. That's a good one. Okay, sadly, sadly, however, if I preach the precepts of God and the laws of God, you know, I get labeled as a legalist. He's such a legalist. He's always got a law and a precept. Well, I'll tell you what, that's the way it is. You want to walk the high road, the precepts and the holy words of God have to walk with you. Now, I need to close. I want to give you some final words of comfort that I find in the midst of trials and temptations and testing. Hebrews 14, verse 15, gives us our first one. It says this, Jesus was tempted as we are. Isn't that incredible? That God would become a man in Jesus and then would allow the world that he had created, the worst of the world that had fallen into, to be a temptation to him. He was God. He should have just wiped it out. But Jesus was so much to identify with us that he allows himself to be subject to the same temptations as we are. That's why I love the book of Mark. Mark is, is the words of Peter probably had written by the scribe Mark. And he's telling about Jesus' story. And he so wants to emphasize the wonder of this, this condescension that God of heaven would become a man. He calls Jesus the Son of Man. That's like us. We're all the Son of Man. And yet he was the Son of God. And he draws this beautiful comparison. The Son of God became the Son of Man so that he could identify with us in our humanness. I love the fact that Jesus walks with us through the trials and the temptations of life. You know, Alexander the Great was an incredible soldier. He was not a man who sat in his office or commanding post and he, he planned strategies. I'm sure he did that. But when he came to the battle, Alexander was famous for fighting with his troops. He would never sit with his generals on the sideline and watch what was there. He was out there right in front. He led them into war. When they were thirsty, he was thirsty. When they were hungry, he was hungry. When they were tired, he was tired. He walked with his troops in battle. Now that is a tiny, tiny picture of what Jesus did for us. God became a man so he could understand us and so he could walk with us in the midst of our own temptations. That's number one, but it gets better. Number two, not only was he tempted as we are, but he never sinned. Jesus never fell for it. He never fell for the, the, the things of Satan, the temptations of Satan. You see, temptation itself is not a sin. Falling into temptation, that's where it crosses the line into sin because it becomes a choice. Now, I don't know if you remember, some years back, I used to have a dog. His name was Miracle. It was this beautiful, enormous, big pitch black German shepherd dog. He was amazing, and he loved me. 
He was like one man dog. That dog loved me. And he was an intriguing dog because he'd come with me everywhere. He had his chair in my office. He'd sit in his chair and he would just stare at me like this. You know, that dog really loved me, you know. He had eyes for nobody else, but he, he loved me. But Miracle was majestic in his ways. He was amazing. He would strut his stuff around the place, you know. And if little weeny little Jack Russells would come and chirp at him, hey, we want to fight with you, you know. <laughs> he would just turn his head and he would walk away, you know. It was so cool. I would take him to the beach and all these little yappers, you know, little piccadies things, and these little Jack Russells would all want to pick a fight with Miracle. And Miracle knew how to handle them. He just turned his head, he'd just turn his back on them, and he would just walk away. I began to think about that. I thought, that's what Jesus wants us to do. Satan's like this stupid little Jack Russell. Yum, 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 yum. Do this, do that, do this. What about this? What about that? We should be like America. We just look at it and say, turn away. Get behind me, Satan, says Jesus. Just like America. People, you're too high to fall for that. You're too high to fall for those stupid little tricks that Satan will throw at you. Walk with a sense of majesty. Walk with a sense of pride in the fact that you are a child of God. And watch what Satan will do. He'll chirp at you from the sideline like the Jack Russell does, but he will fail in his, if you just take on an attitude of who you are. You are a child of God. For goodness sake, behave like one. And watch what Satan will do when you parade that kind of attitude toward him. But it gets better than that. Not only did Jesus not fall into temptation, but he gloriously triumphed over Satan at the same time. How did he do it? It is written. Notice Satan's response to when Jesus says it is written. He didn't sit down and have a debate with Satan. Say, well, Satan, let's just talk about this thing. What about this? What about that? What about the next? He didn't do that. He said, get behind me. It is written. It is written. And watch what Satan does. He runs. He runs with his tail between his legs because Satan cannot bear to listen to that which is written. So use it. Learn it. Hide it in your heart. So when you need it, it's there to be used to protect you at the times of testing the trial and temptation. Don't argue with him. Don't try and rationalize with him. Just know what is written. You say, is that all I need? I think it is. The presence of God and the Word of God is all you need to stand and to shine amidst all the temptations of life. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that through your grace you have given us your Word. It's a powerful Word. It's a powerful thing, this book. You wrote it. And you've given it to us as a tool to help us to stand against the wiles of Satan. It's this book that is given to us to give us authority against him and to walk with a sense of pride and, and dignity with you. Where the Jack Russells of Satan's voice will chirp at us, we'll just walk straight through that thing. We won't even give him the time of day. We'll tell him, get behind me. We don't have got time to talk with you. We've got no time to discuss you, talk about you, or talk with you. It is written. We'll make him run. <laughs> oh, Lord, it's so powerful, and you've given it to us to use. When we want to walk high, Lord, we need to walk holy because a fall may be just down the road. Let us not walk high and then look down and self-destruct in the issues of booze and immorality and illicit relationships and wrong habits and wrong thinking, because that's what Satan wants for us, and he'll push us easily over the edge there. We walk high because we walk holy. We stand on that high and holy place, and we're so privileged to do so. Help us as we seek to do it better to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.